Welcome everyone. My name is Anna Rose. I'm the Exhibition and Programming Associate at the Venda. And thanks so much for joining us today for Art Pass, Art Pass Present. <clears throat> Art Pass Present is a monthly series focused on the significance of memory and history in contemporary artwork. And it's hosted by artist and writer Farah Karapetian and Yves Siegel, the Venda's Chief Curator and Director of Programming. And we're happy, so happy to welcome this month as our guest, Tara Pandea. She's an internationally recognized second generation dance artist, bridge building choreographer, and cultural activist. She's dedicated the last 18 years of her life to the promotion of dance forms from Central Asia through research, study, instruction, and presentation. She creates dance works which evoke beauty, magical surrealism, and wonder, inviting curiosity and questioning of social norms through art. She uses dance as a healing tool, supporting embodiment to empower women to relieve, serve, and restore. Tara worked as a principal dancer, dancer with Cirque du Soleil, touring 1,500 shows over five continents. She's the first Westerner to perform with Lola, the national dance company of Tajikistan, and she's a 2018 Fulbright Scholar. She taught for 10 years in the California public school districts, writing curriculum and teaching a program she created called Geography Explored Through Dance. She has performed taught and created socially engaged projects in 35 countries, working with marginalized groups, serving gender equality initiatives to relieve, restore, and serve. Residencies and awards include an EU-funded Audacious Minds grant, a Rockefeller-funded Asian Cultural Council grant, a Margaret Jenkins Chime Choreographers Mentorship grant, and two Alliance for California Traditional Arts Apprenticeship grants. She balances her work as a dance practitioner with theoretical work. Conduct, conducting dance research as an independent dance scholar through the Rockefeller Foundation and the CEC Arts Link in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, East Turkestan, Pakistan, India, and Russia. Notable concerts of hers include performances in collaboration with UNESCO, the Bauhaus Festival, Karostami's Kulturistan Residency, and Yoyo Ma's Silk Road Project. This year, she co-taught the course, The Great Silk Road, with Dr. Robert Weiner at St. Mary's College. And she's given talks at Cambridge, Royal Holloway, SOAS, Stanford, and Panama universities. Tara is a trained dance ethnologist and holds an MA in dance, dance anthropology from Roehampton University's Center for Dance Research. She also holds dance certificates in non-Western classical dance forms from Xinjiang Arts Institute and Urumqi Uyghur Autonomous, um, Autonomous Xinjiang, China. Uh, Tashkent's Choreography College and Dushanbe's Philharmonic Conservatory. Her solo work has been published and aired on BBC, Voices on Central Asia, New York Times, and Dance Magazine, and OCA Magazine. So this talk will be about a 45 minute conversation between Tara and our co-hosts. After that, we'll leave 15 minutes um, for Q&A. So please get your questions ready during that time. And we appreciate everyone's questions, but please keep them short and concise, no longer than a sentence or two. Um, and if you have comments that aren't questions, please put them in the chat box, um, which is open right now. Feel free to say hi and what city you're tuning in from. And lastly, we'd like to thank Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and our virtual programs. And now Farah will get us started with the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Anna Rose. And welcome, Tara. Last time I saw you, we were in Russia. This is great. <laughs> um, you, right now you're talking to us from San Francisco, right? Yes. Um, and so, I mean, I just, I think I wanna just open with that, um, with that, with that idea of you as a multicultural 21st century woman um, in San Francisco and how, and how you kind of um, combine that with this, uh, with all of these traditional land, dance languages that we've just seen. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think we can both relate to that in the sense of um, this concept of, you know, always trying to have a counterbalance to what is East and what is West and, uh, and trying to kind of fitting in between these supposed two worlds. Um, but really, um, and then inhabiting this kind of <laughs> virtual space where we're floating from continent to continent and and whatnot and and kind of working in the medium supposedly i'm a traditional artist but um not really you know and the idea of what is 
contemporary art, I think is also, um, I think there's a lot of pushback now, um, the more diverse lenses and um, artists coming to the forum um, and presenting their ideas on what, what is contemporary and how, you know, how to utilize craftsmanship from a traditional form to, um, to you know, whatever, recall what is innovative and contemporary and all of those uh, um, kind of ideas of what it, of what technique is um, in that setting. But yeah, um, I'm just very happy to be here and thankful to be part of the discussion. So I'll let you lead the way. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and if I may follow up, uh, Tara, you just mentioned the supposed uh, two worlds, uh, East and West. And also on your website, you call yourself a bridge builder between East and West. Do you feel that these two work, worlds are more or less artificially uh, separated. And I am thinking here in the first place of uh, the tradition of Orientalism, as analyzed by Edward Said, the idea that the Western view of the East is something exotic and also somehow inferior. And then maybe also additionally, the Cold War binary between East and West that might have deepened this sense of uh, differentiation. How, how do you see that? Absolutely correct. Yeah, I ex absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I ref I echo those sentiments very much. So, and I think, as you said, that um, you know it, it exists as a counterbalance. So, if we didn't have supposedly this concept of the East, then the West would would uh, therefore not exist. You know, so uh, that idea of um, uh, you know, when, and also I think it's funny because when there's these call outs for, especially in the arts, it's like you want to have the most salacious, innovative ideas and, and I, you know, I kind of just read past all of that and I, yeah, I'm going to be expressing it through traditional Tajik dance, <laughs> but, um, but this is the concept which is quite, can be universally felt or is, you know, pertinent to all uh, to all people, it's something, you know, at the core of our humanity, whatever the, the topic may be. Um, and, and yes, this idea of the Silk Road and how it, even the Renaissance, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a rediscovering, right? It wasn't a reawakening of remembering something, but it was indeed a, a learning of something from another place, from, from the Eastern world, a, a, a learning of ephemeral knowledge that was then incorporated into, into European um, traditions and thought and um, um, and, and generating a whole new system, a whole new way of looking at things and, um, uh, you know, thought and um, all of those, all of those different things. So I think this um, creating the binaries is very interesting. And then also this related to the Cold War, it's interesting because we say, you know, I'm half, I'm half uh, Indian and half German American, but this idea of being Caucasian, uh, where, you know, the Caucasus are right, you know, right there in uh, above Central Asia on the old Silk Road with so much history. And, and so when, you know, I have um, students of mine who are um, Georgian and they were saying how when they arrived to the United States, they didn't know which box to check because they're from the Caucasus. So then all of a sudden they become ethnicized as uh, you know, Eastern, but then in, in the Western world or in, in, in the United States, we define white as, as being of the Caucasus, but half the people in the United States don't even, you know, um, make that correlation <laughs> or where the Caucasus are. Um, so that's an interesting also kind of um, uh, an interesting point to, to examine about how we, uh, how we, we can tend to other and, and create these uh, counterbalances to, to find our own identities. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, how how do you feel like the the specifics of political change in that region, even though you know trends and influences might be multinational, multi-ethnic, you know, transtemporal even? Um, how do you think the political changes is actually held in in the dance work to, to kind of ground our discussion also in in movement? Uh, you know, I think of like the Afghan war rugs as some kind of beautiful product that comes out of uh, a specific trauma in Afghanistan, uh, where they, you know, the women begin to weave into the patterning like tanks and bombs and things like this. How, how does that stuff, how does, how does the political change in the regions where you've worked end up coming out through dance? 
Yeah, um, I think it's interesting because Europe, you know, they they went through a uh, you know industrial revolution, and that's not the case in Central Asia, right? So, um, so this whole idea of this um, linear progressive um, uh, movement into the contemporary, into mod modernity, is not um, is not so punctuated in that way of like swiping the you know whole slate clean, and now we're in the modern era. Um, so, you know, in Central Asia, in my experience living and working and dancing there, you know, you'll have dancers who are dancing in the national ensemble in Dushanbe in the capital or Tashkent. And on the weekends, they'll go to grandma's house uh, in a village with no running water um, and have a very, you know, traditional um, experience that so they're they're kind of like time travelers, you know, kind of straddling these two worlds quite eloquently, actually, um, in a way that I think um, is, is understood and bridged much more effortless, effortlessly in that sense. Um, so, you know, you still have your, you still have your cell phone, you still have your TikToking and doing Facebook and doing all the Instagram posts and filters and all that. And then, uh, but at the same time, you don't need to go back into history, into ancient history or look in a museum to find these um, traditions because they're living traditions that they're embodied and, and experiencing um, in their lives and you know in the middle of you know punctuated in the middle of their week and then going back to um, a city um, dwelling experience again so I think um, artists particularly in Central Asia from from my exposure and my experience will really create based I mean as from antiquity uh, you create for your who's your patron is it the king is it um, someone who wants to see something more radical is it you know a group of conservative aunties that want to see something that's you know a uh, stuck in a, um, some static um, memory of, of bygone, you know, antiquity, what is, what is, who is the funding patron that will really dictate what, what the artwork that's going to be presented on stage, um, and, and what the angle is, but I think there's a lot more um, variety and diversity um, kind of at the fingertips of a lot of these artists because of the fact that they they have this ability to to straddle these two um, these two worlds so to speak yeah are you finding that the narratives of political change get woven into the into the narrative of the dance I mean in the same way that the form of the rug is this is potentially the same or 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 similar uh, but the narratives that come in because of is that is that something that you yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, dance, because it's ephemeral, right? And so it, it's this ephemeral and embodied knowledge. Um, so when it travels, it, it has the ability to, to stay in the minds and hearts of people through sonic lineages, movement lineages, um, independent of time and space, but then very much embodied from the place where it was birthed. So it was birthed in that place. And there's a lot of different dynamics going on there. It's it's the past and the present and um, all of these traditions, this kind of lineage of traditions, along with, you know, the um, particular to Central Asia, you know, you, you layer it on top of the traditions of the, you know, ancient Persian and Turkic empires, you layer that with Soviet history and you layer it with, um, mm -hmm. you know, technology and transnationalism and and all of that kind of world opened up as well. So you can see all of these really interesting and kind of, you know, funny, peculiar, and very specific to that region um, themes that can develop and and come out. I mean, I saw it was a Michael Jackson with um, Kulyabi, which is a very traditional old, like, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 year old um, uh, dance tradition using mouth harps and, and fully veiled, but then they were doing it to a Michael Jackson song on traditional instruments with, with um, using traditional movement to express it. So it's like, that's totally normal. These can all exist and still be respectful of the and borrowing something that's, that's an alien um, tradition to, to create something that feels very familiar to the receiving audience. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can I follow up on this uh, or what I see as a possible tension between those traditions and the political use of those traditions, oh, yeah. especially in the, the post-Soviet uh, republics where the different newborn nations like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, etc., 
uh, claim to own the century old uh, cultural traditions and dance is one of them. And I think it's so interesting that on the one hand, there are these very deep regional traditions, but then on the other hand, there are the new nation states claiming to be the personification or the realization of, the, of these traditions with a very um, evident political uh, program behind it. How do you see this tension? Yeah, and tension is exactly the word to use. That's absolutely right. Um, uh, yes, well, I mean, I have to be careful how much I verbalize, but you know, as a dance, as a the first Western dancer to dance inside of the National Dance Company in Tajikistan, I definitely, um, you know, I could write volumes of books about what I what I saw. <laughs> but, um, you know, for example, if we take Shesh Makam, which is a musical and dance tradition, Shesh meaning six in Farsi Persian, um, Makam is the musical nodes or scale, it's an ancient, um, uh, derived from Arabic uh, musical uh, system. And, um, and originally, because the region of uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan was one area, um, it was very mixed. So it would have Uzbek, uh, Turkic and Persian um, uh, poetry inter, inter, interwoven. Um, and, but the dance form, the you know, nonverbal element of that tradition, uh, it still remains the same because I've studied Sheshmakam both in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, but there's this very um, kind of strong nationalism. And um, during the Soviet era, when they bifurcated the region into two nation states, Tajikistan and um, Uzbekistan currently, although Samarkand and Bukhara have, I think 70, 60% uh, or more uh, Persian Tajik speaking population in Uzbekistan itself, um, they, in an effort to kind of for nation building, they cleaned up and codified that tradition to have two very separate Sheshmakam traditions. So one was purely Uzbek. So in the conservatories, they they notated and um, kind of took out all of the wording that was Persian or Tajik um, on the Uzbek side in the conservatories and, and vice versa for Tajikistan. Um, you know, which is, is just interesting. And then, you know, certain, there's certain attitudes, you know, some artists who are more um, liberal to these, um, you know, you know, more, I've, obviously there's an awareness of it, but um, some people are more nationalistic about it, um, kind of saying this is, this is an only Uzbek tradition, but I mean, in reality, uh, Shash is not, it's, it's not to be Iki Uch, sorry, my, my uh, <laughs> Turkic, yeah, alta alta. It's not alta makam. Alta is six in in uh, you know Uzbek. Uh, it's shesh makam, which is Persian. So so even to right. say, okay, this is a purely you know hundred percent Uzbek form. You know, sorry, the tradition is is a Farsi word. So um, there's yeah. got to be a little more give and take with that. Um, and yeah. then there's also very negative connotations, not in not amongst everyone with the you know intelligentsia and the cultured. Uh, groups and and of course in in, in village settings with um, more less conservative regions, uh, dance is of course a huge part of of um, of um, rites of passage, holidays, um, so many different things uh, showing pantomiming chores, pantomiming environment. But there's also a very strong sentiment about uh, the word dancer rakosa. Uh, which is used throughout Central Asia, um, can have very negative connotations. I've been told several times not to use that word because it's associated with, uh, synonymous with prostitute, essentially. Um, and I refuse to change it because that's, that is, oh, you can use a, a more flowery word or blah, blah, blah. You know, you're a, you know, you're a classically trained artist, da, da, da. I don't care. That's the word that it is. I will use that word. Um, right. And that's, that's it. Sorry, but we're not... Uh, you know, and this whole back to the counterbalance, this whole idea that, um, you know, that a, a thinking body is one that is still. So we're not, you know, our brains are not just uh, working in some amazing way. And then we're just meaningless vessels that contain the brain that's up here. Sorry, no, we, we are living, breathing people. And that, that fact matters to how we think and also how we think about thinking itself. You know, these epistemologies are related to the whole body. The whole body has intelligence throughout it. And so I push very much against, um, as a necessity, as a second generation dancer, 
but also as um, circumstance of what I've experienced as a, as a single woman traveling as a dancer, um, I push very much against those sentiments because um, it's very entangled. It's very entangled and um, yeah. Thank you. That's so interesting. You know, I think I, I heard in another interview that you were giving, um, you talked about how dance was used to promote pluralism during the civil war in Tajikistan in the 90s. And, um, and I, I was trying to picture like how the dances from different regions would be featured in one piece that would be legible to people. And now it sounds like part of what you're saying is that it's linguistic, it's verbal. The right. ways that the states would try, you know, that, that, a, that a overseeing political body would, is there another way in which that kind of pluralism was, was legible or credible um, or is it mostly uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so like even going to ballet because we, you know, we, so ballet, right, it comes from uh, King Louis of the court. It was the original, originally he made himself the, the star of the show, right? He was the son in all the ballets and everyone kind of revolved around him. And we, now we think of it as uh, a genreless form, but in, indeed it is a ethnic dance form specific to a specific part of Europe from France. Um, and, and that is uh, proven through the flora and the fauna of the sets, right? You, we're not seeing, um, you know, Native Americans on canoes squashing um, pumpkin and acorns in the background of the set, right? We're seeing uh, a, uh, maybe a farmer or a hunter and we're seeing wolves and we're seeing ferns. We're seeing things that are very embodied, um, you know, very important information that we can decode just by visually looking at the scene and yet we think it's um, genre list but mm -hmm. actually it's, it has a lot of you know embedded in metadata that's um, embedded in that and and so um, so the same can go for um, dance from Central Asia right so poppies are native to that region so the in the plain lands the um you'll see the costumes have like if you look on my ceiling <laughs> these mm -hmm. are um this is suzani traditional um hand woven um uh artwork from both uzbekistan and tajikistan you'll see that uh, right on the front of their tunics um uh, for the dancers it also ladies you know in traditional settings will wear those and i do believe that a lot of these dance forms or that pretty much all dance forms are are a result of the environment that they're created in and so um i guess getting back to what you're saying uh, promoting pr pluralism in that way there's so much encoded metadata that's that's loaded just loaded in in um the from the costuming to the jewelry to to mm -hmm. the different gestural uh language that um would be recognizable to audience members who um who recognize their own surroundings recognize um uh these different art traditions that are all um kind of highly packed into this maybe one one piece of maybe five minute dance um that would give a lot of information for someone who who um, that was familiar to them outside of the context, if we're showing it, uh, I don't know, on a contemporary American stage, um, a lot of it might be lost, you know? Um, but yes, if it did provide a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, it can provide a lot of, depending on how you want to use that, there's a huge disparity between the propaganda of dance and the treatment of its practitioners, um, how they were treated. And also during the Soviet period, this whole emancipation of, of women, that whole initiative, a lot of the women were um, encouraged to, you know, the, to uh, remove the paranda, to remove the veil and, and go on stage and, you know, this whole um, uh, kind of empowerment, but they were not nothing was taken into account in terms of what was actually going to happen inside of these communities without protection for these women to go on stage, remove the paranda, the first woman to do it was burned and, and, and killed because there was, you know, this was the over overarching policy from the USSR period, but, um, but there was very little um, kind of homework done in terms of cultural sensitivity of what what is going to happen with this dynamic if it wasn't done with incremental um you know awareness and and consciousness of of um how the community would react to that uh yes the next woman after that tamara hanum she was second to do that and she is a beloved revered artist of uzbekistan but um but little is said about the woman who came before her yeah 
Tara, you, you mentioned uh, the Silk Road, which for many, many centuries connected Europe and uh, Eastern Asia. Um, that also, of course, reminds me of Yo-Yo Ma's project, the Silk, Silk Road project, where he invited musicians from all the countries along the old Silk Road to uh, take part in an ensemble and get to know each other, get to know each other's instruments, each other mu musical traditions, etc. Were you inspired by a comparable idea to integrate these um, different traditions, uh, or maybe they are not even that different uh, because they have uh, in part a common origin? And also, have you been in touch with Yo Yo Ma or, or with people from? um the Silk Road Ensemble? Yeah, um, no, I haven't. I, I hope to someday again. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it was a wonderful experience being able to um, to make that piece uh, for him. And um, yes, I mean, I do think obviously, ultimately, human beings, we all want to express something, even if we can't put our finger on what it is we want to express. Um, and, and I do find that, you know, obviously as, as artists, I think that this is like a, it's just a no brainer. I mean, to the, I remember there was some project, um, through the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and they were going to say, okay, what are we going to do? What's going to happen when we get a red state artist, uh, an artist from California and some artists from Russia? Like, what is the tension going to be between, <laughs> and it was like, there is no tension at all. We just, okay, what do we want to make? Let's, let's make something together, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, just, I think people ultimately respond to sincerity and honesty. That's what really, um, what shines through in, in, in craftsmanship and creating something, whatever, whatever the medium may be. Um, when you say the art of something, it's, it's uh, with the absence, when we omit that word, the art of something, it's, it's something that's not done with excellence. It's something that's not done with craftsmanship. Um, and so it's, it's whether or not that resonate, that particular art form resonates with you. We can all agree that uh, craftsmanship is something that, that has to go into the, the art making of something. Um, particular to dancers, I think, uh, when we, when we physicalize our thoughts, um, it's something that's much more uh, intimate and personal than, you know, when we verbalize our thoughts, we can omit a lot. We don't have to say a lot of the things that we're thinking, but physical thoughts are, are when you see a dancer on stage, that's why you're, you're seeing the whole person, you're seeing the whole dancer because you can't hide from the physicality of your, um, of those thoughts, right? So, uh, that's what I would say to that. I'm always, I'm always sparked and hungry for more exchanges and, um, you know, counter, counter opinions and uh, movement qualities and, and sounds that inspire because um, that's, that's what, you know, I, I, I crave that to be able to examine and look at my positionality, examine my own thoughts that I thought were neutral and, and realize, wait a minute, that's, you know, turn them upside down again and rethink rethink constantly rethinking constantly putting myself in new environments to um to gain that you know to hopefully to develop myself to grow and um and to gain new ways of new perspectives new lenses new ways of looking at things problems and if i understand you correctly that rethinking is very much a bodily experience as, as well Absolutely, absolutely, very, very much. I think uh, we all. I think we've, we've maybe some, some of us have lost it, but it's very easy to hone, hone back into that. It's like people. Oh, when did you start dancing? It's like, when did you stop dancing? Everyone, everyone danced at some point in their lives, right? And I think that uh, passion is not a physical thing, right? It's, it's energy. So we know when we're around maybe people or situations where it's negative, your body ultimately back of your neck, your stomach will churn, it will pull away from that negative thing. And when it's something positive, you feel lighter, you feel like a better, better energy, lighter energy inside of yourself. That's passion, right? So um, I think just centering into, you know, this basic uh, body intelligence that we all have access to is just through uh, noticing 
watching, noticing, and then feeling what your body is giving you, constantly giving you feedback. I think um, this, I love this, I'm really interested in neuroscience. I think Antonio Damasi, he's the neuroscientist, was, uh, he did this study showing that the cognitive brain is 10 times slower than the body in, um, you know, deciphering impending failure and danger and all of that. The body has so much intelligence inside of it, you know, inside of ourselves. So I think, um, absolutely for me it's it's always trying to recenter back if if i kind of get too much in my head which is happening a lot with the pandemic i just you know just move my <laughs> shake back down into my chair and get back into my body and then it's uh it's a lot easier to make decisions a lot easier to to have more interesting thoughts too um yeah it's interesting because i wanted to ask you about authenticity uh, which was the subject of one of your uh, residencies, the Kiarostami residency in Paris, what makes something truly authentic. And I, you know, I was thinking that that pertained specifically to this kind of issue of traditional dance and authenticity around the notion of the traditional. But what you're talking about is also an authenticity of the self and the experience of whatever um, kind of uh, movement practice you, you, you're you in at the moment, right? I mean, is that something you talked about there? Uh, the question of these uh, uh, kind of a self-expression and authenticity therein and, and this other external yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so it was interesting because Ahmed, who's Kiristami's son, he, uh, famous um, Persian filmmaker, he, he had gathered together people from very different um, backgrounds, journalists and um, writers and dancer, musician, um, and from different continents and things like that. And we did a lot of different readings on, you know, Greek myths and philosophy and eight, eight hours a day reading all these different texts. And then it was interesting. We had tears, we had huge arguments, we had wonderful moments. I mean, it was very interesting to see because he really did do a good job of selecting very opposite, opposite people. Um, and I think one of the other things is, is how we perceive, you know, the different professions that we each had or that mediums that we worked in, uh, they were thinking, oh, the pretty dancer, you know, like, oh, I, you know, she, you know, you have to have a, this concept of the dance, a dance tune. Um, is that it has to be happy and upbeat to be able to dance to, or that the idea that, um, uh, I don't know, that, you know, just perceptions that and stereotypes that exist about, you know, oh, but I just get up and I start dancing around the room, which of course, I mean, of course I do do that. I love, I, I'm a dancer by nature. I do get uh, swept away by certain music and things like that, but um, I can be quite methodical um, and very organized and very um, kind of clinical in some ways with, with how I structure my time and how I create um, new choreographic pieces and approaching new projects. And I think that was something, oops, excuse me. Um, let me see, where is that phone? Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, anyways, authentic. it's authentic. It's authentic, <laughs> it's authentic right? <laughs> there we go. Anyways, um, yeah. So I just think it's interesting how um, you know the, these these ideas of of again, you know, authentic to be authentic. You you just get swept away in the moment, in the passion of it, and and there's no planning and there's no um, framework or structure to the whole thing. Um, it, you know, it, it's just a in interesting by the end of those two weeks, uh, we, we had all had a newfound understanding of, you know, the, the behind the scenes mechanics and the tech technique and, and, and some of those, those inner workings that, um, you know, I guess if you don't, you haven't put in the work, then, then those assumptions are made, which is natural to make those assumptions. But, um, yeah, that's all to say. <laughs> About that's that. interesting. It sounds like there are actually two forms of authenticity. One is the personal one and the spontaneity, etc. Et and the other is the authenticity of the traditions you keep alive. And I wanted to ask you, how do you, you already mentioned this mixture of uh, Michael Jackson and uh, regional um, uh, dance traditions, etc. But how do you balance uh, those traditions in a way that they become understandable uh, for a contemporary audience? And do you sometimes sacrifice certain nuances in order to make them speak to 
the current uh, uh, audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, just when you were asking that came to mind this, this idea of Das Folk, um, the, mm. you know, um, remember the name of the German anthropologist who came up with this kind of idea of the, the, the quaint uh, peasant, you know, from the, the, from the village side is the most authentic version of, of our true selves. And, uh, but in reality, when, you know, going to, for example, the Pamirs and Badakhshan and the Afghan Tajik border, it's like uh, we did, we conducted field work um, through this anthropological project uh, was 15 years ago and uh, asking all these questions and, and, you know, 60, 70 hours of footage. And I went back there, uh, what, in the last five years, four or five years. And since then, now that that gentleman who does this beautiful horse dance up in the mountains, he, he has a 14 year old daughter and she, the way her body is built, she has a very sinewy spine and she creates these very, um, very, very um, serpentine type movements that none of those I ever saw when I was there 15 years ago. And now um, he, he kind of follows, he's mirroring his own daughter's movements quality. And I've seen a complete transformation in what supposedly is traditional Palmyri dance from that region based on, you know, from body to body, it changes. Also the aesthetic changes obviously as well. Even if you have a, you know, rubber stamp, try to put it onto the next body, the exact same choreography, mm -hmm. I don't have the same genetics and physical you know, measurements as my teacher. So it's going to obviously transform differently into my, into my body and my experiences of how I interpret all of that. So um, it, anyways, it, it's just all to say it's interesting to see how, how things develop uh, based on these, these concepts of, of innovation and, and, and authenticity and tradition and contemporary and all of that. Um, and when I'm creating for for pieces, you know, um, where yes, there isn't that foundational knowledge of maybe the fairy tales or certain references to things or um, musical instruments. I mean, for example, in in Berlin, I created a piece called the Raksistan, which is um, uh, is a word of my own creation. It's uh, Rax means dance in Farsi and for, uh, also in Arabic. Um, also used in the Turkic world as well. And uh, Istan means the land of, so the same like Netherlands or, you know, all these land at the end, same idea. Um, so it's the land of dance. Um, and so I, I broke tradition to a degree, but while still respecting the, the, the traditional movement quality or vocabulary, um, but you know, without completely dismantling it, but you know, being with an awareness which takes you know you know decades to have understanding of these nuances of you know where, you know how far how far to push it. I was mentored by a ballet um, kind of master who uh, ballet of difference. His name is Richard Siegel, um, and so he really wanted me to push it. You know, push it. Oh, come on, push it to this, and I you know I'm already pushing it. <laughs> to this this fine line where it's 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 an unspoken line um and i'm fine to do that but then there is you know i you know i've dedicated almost two decades of my life to these forms to earning trust to to my teachers to the lineage um so there's there's certain things that i won't do um then there's certain things i will there's space to play within that for example using i did sketches of um different uh, you know abstract shapes um uh, for this piece, I choreographed around the the emotion of fear, fear of other. So I made a whole dance piece around the idea of fear, and um, and and then using things that sound very modern, like the Jew's harp, which is the mouth harp. It sounds like an electronic techno, um, <laughs> you know, piece once it has the vibrational uh, echo amplified in the speakers. But it's it's in fact, a, you know, it's a man-made instrument that's just you're just using your finger and your, your lips to create the sound, um, but it can sound very avant-garde. You're mining these kind of avant-garde concepts in inside of antiquity, um, yeah. which I think has a lot of uh, potential and which I think we, we have always done, but we just, we don't frame it that way anymore. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Afera. I think we have time for one more question. And 
please, up to you. But um, uh, then we go to the Q and A. So um, yeah, if you have um, uh, questions, please put them under the Q and A box where Vera and I will be looking. Um, well, I wanted to ask about the um, the fluency of your audiences with respect to all of these nuances that you're that you're mentioning. You know, the poppies on the dress, or the harp, or the line. Indeed, that the person with whom you are working uh, on this last dance. You know, he says you want to go further. You say there's a line. What happens when you take that dance and you perform it at the Vendee Museum in, in Los Angeles, you know, <laughs> which is going to happen. And please do this. <laughs> uh, what happens when you do that and the audience here, and obviously the Vendee's audience is always very informed, but uh, but in, in certain contexts, less so. Um, do you find that, uh, do you, are you concerned with fluency? Uh, do, you, do you find that audiences in other places where, where the kind of fluency isn't there, or is it a more exoticizing experience? Is there more of a viewership relationship to you when you're dancing there? Although of course you are dancing for an audience in many cases, most cases. Um, is, the, is there something more participatory about the act of viewing? Yeah. Um... I definitely create work with a with a clear awareness of you know what is the reception going to be from that audience and who is the audience I'm trying to speak to, mm -hmm. um, but not wanting to make it where it's to the point that I'm just spoon feeding everything. Like when I was dancing in Cirque du Soleil, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of kind of very mush mushy, you know, beautiful, amazing, high caliber artists and beautiful sets and, you know, top caliber uh, athletes really um, working together. But uh, sometimes some of the themes could be very muddied um, and then very, very intricate, you know, notes about this, oh, this represents water and this is going to be this. And, th <laughs> and then in the end, you know, we're in a football stadium with, you know, whatever, how many <laughs> 10,000 people and we're little dots. And do you think they're really going to get the whole storyline that there's a, this is a piece of water and this is no, and, and there's no program notes either. So, um, you know, to have the director kind of pounding that into your head mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I, I highly doubt that any of those little nuanced uh, uh, details were really um, <laughs> received. Uh, of course, it were, and that's in contrast to having these giant feats of athletic, um, you know, virtuosic, um, you know, acrobatic uh, acts in between some moments punctuated with moments of dance. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, as choreographers, I do think what is choreographers we are uh, we are writers. We write our choices and arguments in space through arranging bodies in space. And and dancers are very much theorists in the sense that we think on our feet, right? And we, uh, you know, to really um, make those choices, you have to be, you know, constantly adjusting and moving to the space and to the bodies that are um, maybe whirling past you or maybe slowly slowly walking towards you, whatever the case may be. Um, and I, I think it's true, you know, I, I definitely do adjust from audience to audience, um, uh, uh, depending on, like you said, fluency, depending on where I do think, I'm, I'm aware of my positionality, you know, I'm half East, half West, born in the United States. Um, you know, I'm not gonna necessarily create something um, I will definitely adjust it according to to who the audience is and and the same goes for dancers that I work with I'm not going to rubber stamp choreography on dancers if if I can see the personality and the body type is is something that could be much better utilized in another way or um, it just you know, you have to, you know what they say is when a baby is born you don't just give them a name right you have to look at look at the the quality the nature of the the personality of that that child and then kind of it develops what uh what fits what fits for that for that situation and i think that um dancers and artists in general we've from from eons we've had to always be kind of chameleons of sorts to adjust to our uh to our audience and adjust to um how how that information embedded in encoded information is being um to send to the audience whether whether it needs to be 
some you know linear storyline or maybe something very abstract that is uh, free to be taken as as they wish um it, it changes every time yeah thank you we do have one uh, question uh, in the q a box by bruce hollyhan he writes while it is apparent to me that dance like music and other arts is a deeply rooted affirmation of life the compartmentalization of art into genres and categories can be restrictive. Do you think that political and cultural suppression of such arts to be an ongoing thing, one which requires an ongoing vigilance? Absolutely, thank you for that question. Absolutely, um, just coming to mind, uh, I was living in London for the last two years and dancing in the Uyghur, um, London Uyghur, Dance uh, Ensemble, uh, now renamed the Silk Road Ensemble. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what the situation um, uh, with the Uyghur, Uyghur community abroad and, and in China, you know, the only kind of uh, thing left is their uh, ephemeral arts, so their music and dance, um, their languages is dying and a lot of the other uh, traditions are, are forbidden to be practiced. So, um, you know, I call myself a dance artist, but there's there's so many other ways that I would be happy to, to not, uh, you know, categorize it in that way. I'm just art making is art making. Um, and and uh, what the intentionality behind it, the honesty behind it is um, kind of ultimately what comes forward, how it's how it's expressed is a, is another story, but um, but what you know what what messages or what information are you trying to either serve or put forward, um, like you like you said. So um, yeah, in the situation of the the Uyghur community, it's it's very much that case is that there needs to be a a clear vigilance about um, uh, kind of creating vis positive visibility or some visibility um, because there's also the hegemonic discourses of, of you know, um, putting forward one, one art form or one cultural tradition more than the other. That's a whole other thing you can get into. And then, and then this, again, this idea of, um, of dance is not an intellectual pursuit, uh, which is, that's a whole other thing that, uh, you know, also exists in in the Western world as well. Um, dance, as they say, is the the lowest of the high arts <laughs> um, because we we use our bodies as our instrument, and that um, from antiquity has been a lot of you know so many stories of dancers um, becoming uh, musicians or singers to have a more reputable um, you know higher regarded reputation as as artists in the high arts um so that's a whole other loaded um conversation um that you know can get into another time <laughs> yeah maybe if, if i can uh, briefly follow up on this uh, you did uh, a dance residency in autonomous uh, xinjiang which is in the heart of the uyghur uh, uh, community region uh, that actually used to be the eastern end of the silk road um, did you experience how important dance was for the um, local community to escape the repression and the um, awful human rights situation in that region? What, what were your experiences there? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I was followed by spies almost the whole seven months I was um, on campus and, and then in the region. Um, and um, there was a lot of questioning about why I was only learning Uyghur classical dance and not the other traditions of dance. Um, I tried to kind of soften it or cushion it by saying I was learning uh, Chinese minority dance. My interest was in Chinese minority dance. Um, didn't really fully help my cause because I wasn't learning the other Chinese minority dances. So there was a kind of a, a little bit of a red flag there. Um, and then I was also, I think the only foreigner that had ever been put into the master's program with the other dancers. There was a Fulbright scholar that had gone there, but she was taught um, independently, privately the entire time segregated from the dance, other dancers. But because of my dance training background, 
um, foundationally in um, non-Western classical forms in uh, Uzbek and, and Tajik doyravarax, um, which is the um, the drumming and dance tradition, which um, uh, which was, you know, incidentally, this the the woman uh, Timur Khan she danced with Tamara Khanum, who is the most revered um, dancer from Uzbekistan. So they, at that time during the Soviet era, all studied in the same choreography college in Tashkent. So um, because of that foundational training that I had, I was able to go just kind of plug myself right into the into the master's program. Um, but there was a, yeah, there was a lot of suspicion surrounding that. And, um, yeah, it was, it was very hard to, you know, it's, it's such a beautiful dance form and the music and the dance is so incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, a lot of, a lot of also, you know, history and embedded, um, mythological stories and all of those things, uh, woven into the, into the movements, into the gestures. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's embodied knowledge. It's, it's ephemeral knowledge that's, that's created through, again, bodily labor. Um, and it's interesting because that's really what is, is really remains the core of that remains. But at the same time, again, there's this juxtaposition because, uh, this is the form that's, that's holding kind of the key of these, of these cultural traditions. And yet in some cases in more conservative <laughs> communities, uh, dance is not given monetary value or respect in the wider field of um, uh, of, of some of these communities um, due to conservatism or also in the field of arts um, and also in, quite frankly in the field of academia too so um, it's just a it's a it's a balancing act between those two but um, you know, in Europe, it's it's definitely um, artists of the of the Uyghur diaspora are definitely enduring in that way as as best they can. But it's it's kind of heartbreaking to to see that erasure of um, of culture and people. Um, yeah, I have. I don't think I'll ever be able to go back. I don't. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. You also call. I mean, you call yourself a dance activist sometimes as well, or at least I've heard that. I mean, yeah. and and this this uh, this residency you're discussing is probably, I would imagine, part of that on some level. If you're keeping a dance language, a body language alive culturally, but you also did the thing where you um, what was it called, Cirque du Monde? Uh, I don't know if that counts for you as dance activism, but it's to me, I'm categorizing it in the same way. It's the it's the um, philanthropic social outreach liaison aspect of Cirque du Soleil, where you you taught circus arts to Lebanese and Palestinian refugees, children living in Lebanon, children with HIV in South Africa. So there's that kind of dance activism where you're using it to uh, activate, um, you know, um, experiences in communities who need healing potentially. And then when I met you in St. Petersburg, you were on the CEC thing where residency where you um, where you were thinking of working with Tajik laborers around their um, the gestures associated with daily chores and um, uh, other kinds of um, duties, um, Tajiks being, um, you know, a major labor force in Russia right now. Um, so I guess I'm thinking about as as my final question for you that category of dance activism and and and. I mean, it really doesn't matter, uh, as you've said, you know, the category, whether whether these are performative art practices, whether these are dance arts, or whether this is dance activism, the category, the term doesn't matter so much. Um, but you, you want to speak to any of those projects in particular and, and what success looks like in those situations as opposed to um, on stage? Yeah. Yes, this is an enormous question, and we still have the <laughs> question in the Q and A box. Can Just you think it easy. Try to keep light, it a little short. Question. <laughs> yeah. Just you know, talk about everything that matters right now. <laughs> Just a light little question to end up. No, I mean, that's a, you know, it is a good, um, I think a good thing to keep in all of our minds because we, we, we say that arts are not essential to society, but we can't say that and then turn around and every waking free moment of our lives, uh, you know, uh, use uh, Netflix and uh, Spotify and every other art form kind of uh, all the tactile um, uh 
soft skills, um, uh, you know, to fill our days um, to basically, you know, science sure will cure us from the pandemic, but what has ultimately actually made us survive through this pandemic? That's the arts, right? That's what's really these tactile soft, you know, skills of, of an enduring humanity of kind of having some type of, um, you know, communal um, connection to, to others is, is the arts ultimately, right? Um, and, uh, and I don't think it's just because I'm speaking to fellow artists. I do think that truly, you know, um, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be coming out of this just purely with, um, with medicine, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, without, with all, without all of the, um, all of these, these art traditions and, and other things to keep our, our minds and our hearts kind of enduring in this time. Um, and I don't know. Um, well, Simna, our audience member, I'm going to let her question kind of finish this off and, yeah, and, yeah. and take off from your yeah, answer yeah. there. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'll be good. <laughs> um, she, she's speaking of that kind of response uh, to the pandemic, the fact that we all really did need um, need artwork. She asks how you get an audience that's used to interpreting everything intellectually to have the embodied experience of, of watching dance. So if, if during the pandemic we've been reading, we've been watching TV, we've been experiencing art in all these ways and realizing its place in our lives, um, I'm gonna combine those two things and, and ask how, how can we get people to recognize um, and experience uh, dance um, uh, without having training in how to do so? How do yeah. we influence the way people do? Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, it's a great question and I think I think it really, I mean, there's no kind of magic, magic bullet thing. It's really just exposure, um, uh, you know, exposure, in-person exposure is, is preferable. Um, but, you know, right now, at least, you know, we have, we do have technology to be able to, I've, I've seen some actually some quite, you know, moving, moving pieces, uh, even with the distance and technology obscuring that, um, you know, sometimes technology can give me a feeling of coldness where I don't really feel the warmth of the performance coming through. But um, if we really want transformation, I think that, you know, uh, you know, it's not like this TED Talks wrap up ending that we can do it and believe in ourselves and we have the keys and everything's at our fingertips. No, it's not. No, it's not. You know, the, the, the system is rigged against us in many cases and we have to slog through mm -hmm. the, the hard stuff, the philosophy, the arts, the uh, the socio-political um, tensions and dynamics of histories and all these ambiguities, all of these contradictions, we need to consider all of those, um, you know, when, um, when trying to find solutions for change and transformation, it's not a magic bullet answer, it's not uh, I don't think it's easy work. Um, I think it's it takes repetition. It takes um, you know intentional focus and time and um, and getting comfortable with dis, you know with discomfort, <laughs> um, but but continuing forward nevertheless, uh, in spite of our fears, in spite of our uh, you know maybe you know misunderstandings, in, in spite of you know when I travel, I try to travel as a traveler, not as a tourist. It's I've had many uncomfortable, um, you know, very bizarre <laughs> uh, scenarios, but the ultimate uh, end result, the receipts that I have for that is that, um, you know, I've carved out more moments of humanity and, and, and listening and understanding through that process. And I think we have to get more um, vigilant about being uncomfortable and, and actually examining those things and slogging through the hard stuff. Um, because that's that's ultimately what we need. What we need, I think, for for um, for more um, meaningful change. Yeah. Well, on that beautiful note, uh, Tara, <laughs> I want to thank you for a very inspiring and also energizing uh, presentation. It was uh, really wonderful to have you here for the interview. Thank you so much. So grateful to be here. <laughs> thank you. The yeah. next week, uh, and we continue with a Cold War Spaces interview with Suda Raya Gopalam, who is a senior lecturer at the uh, University of Amsterdam. And uh, I will speak with her about the use and appropriation of Soviet objects in Cuba and India. 
Then the week thereafter, my guest is uh, Karl Schlegel, German historian with whom I will uh, talk about Chanel Number no. 5 and Brett Moscow as the two perfumes that uh, defined the Cold War. So <laughs> wow. hope to see you there and wish you a wonderful week. <laughs>